Welcome to the video about pawns. Like a knight, the pawn is often one of the trickiest pieces to really nail down when you're first starting out playing chess. So it's important that we establish a solid foundation of knowledge for everything about pawns before you're really ready to play a complete game. As a quick reminder, each player and each side gets eight pawns to start with at the beginning of a game, and their starting positions are all across the second rank. The pawn is the only piece in the game of chess that cannot move backwards. All right, so that's actually an easy thing to remember, but it's important at the same time. The pawn also has the option on its very first move, and only on its very first move, when it's located here on the second rank, to move two squares forward instead of only one. Okay? So you as the player have the choice. There's nothing compelling you necessarily to always move a pawn two squares forward on its very first move. It is your choice. Okay? So for example, if you're opening the game from the white side of things, you can advance a pawn one square forward, or you can advance it two squares forward like this. But once you advance the pawn two squares forward, you can only advance it one square forward for the remainder of its life in the game. Similarly, if you advance it only one square forward on its first move, you've used up the chance to advance it two squares forward at a given time, because that only applies on its first opening move. Okay, so the pawn, as far as its movement, is a fairly simple piece. It can only advance one square forward at a time, with the exception of its first move, and it can never go backwards. However, what is often trickiest about a pawn is that it is the only piece in chess that captures distinctly differently than how it moves. So check this out. Let's pretend in this position that black moves his pawn forward two squares with this advance. I will make a random move with my knight. And then let's pretend that black plays his pawn to d5, for example. It's important to note that this pawn cannot move forward one square because black's pawn is currently occupying that square. However, recall that pawns capture diagonally one square, okay? So in this position, white can actually capture the pawn on d5 as follows, like this, okay? Now remember, these captures can only take place one square at a time. So for example, from this position, this pawn cannot act like a bishop and capture two squares in a diagonal direction. So it can't, for example, capture this pawn on f7 or this pawn on b7, all right? So let's pretend black plays his pawn to c6. And now if you want to focus on moving the pawn again, you have options, okay? You can either advance it one square forward or capture this pawn on c6. There are two further rules about pawns that we have not gone over yet. And this is the first one. This is called pawn promotion. And what this means is when a pawn, either yours or your opponent's, reaches the second to last rank, so from the white perspective, that would be the seventh rank here, or from the black perspective, the second rank here, okay, so one rank away from the final rank on the board. If you advance your pawn to the end of the board, something happens. Your pawn actually transforms. And the cool thing is, you can replace the pawn with any piece that you'd like to choose, and it remains that way as long as it's not captured. So it's really your choice. Now obviously, because you have the choice, 
why would you want to choose anything except a queen? And this is usually right. So because the queen is the most powerful piece in the game, and 99% of the time, you are going to want to make a queen with your pawn. That's why in kind of chess slang, we call that queening the pawn, because you're almost always going to get a queen once you reach the end of the board. Since the queen has the powers of both a rook and a bishop combined, it doesn't really make sense why you'd want to change for one of those. However, there are rare cases, you know, probably less than 1% of situations, when exchanging the pawn for the knight is the correct play. But that is a very, very rare circumstance. So all you have to remember about promoting is if your pawn has a clear path down the board, I mean, you can imagine in later stages of the game when there are fewer pieces on the board, if your pawn has the opportunity to advance to the other side of the board, this can become a very powerful technique and thing to do because you can get a full queen in return. All right? So all you do when you queen your pawn is you replace the pawn on the queening square with whatever it is, I'm just gonna call it a queen for now, and the pawn gets removed from the game, and that's it. A tad complicated, but play enough and you'll get used to it. And so in this position, for example, this action of queening the pawn actually leads to checkmate in this position. Because as you can see, now that there is suddenly a queen here, the queen is attacking the king, and the king has no escape squares. So this game is actually over and white wins. Just to make sure visually you guys can understand it from the black perspective too, let's just pretend you had this situation, right? So it's just the same position with the board flipped around, just so you can see it visually, okay guys? So once again, if you advance any of your pawns to the second to last rank and you're about to get to the very last rank, if you successfully do so, you are able to trade in your pawn for any piece of your desire, whatever you want to choose, and that's almost always going to be the queen. Okay? And this is exactly how it looks in the game. You get a new queen, the pawn goes away, and that piece is live. It is an active player in the game until it is captured just like any other piece in chess. Finally, last but not least, is probably the most complicated rule with regards to pawns. And it's one of the more obscure rules in chess, to be honest. And uh, if anything is going to trip you up at first or confuse you, this is it. But hopefully after practicing some of the exercises and going through this video, you will be able to understand this move. All right. So the concept I'm going to introduce is named after a French phrase, uh, two words. Okay, and it is a very interesting way to capture with a pawn in chess. And there's a very unique situation when this can happen. Okay, so we have a situation here where in this position, let's pretend that black plays his pawn to f5. In this situation, white can actually capture this pawn on f5 with this move. Pawn takes f6. Now you might go, whoa, 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 that looks crazy, right? You know, you just told us that pawns capture one square diagonally, and obviously there has to be a piece there. This is the one exception in chess where that is not true. So the name of this rule is called en passant, and it's French meaning in passing. Okay, so let's break down how this works, and this only works in a very unique circumstance. So the only way en passant works is if your opponent moves a pawn directly adjacent or abreast to your own pawn on its very first move, you have the option to take and capture that pawn in the pawn's normal pathway. Just like the pawn would be here on f6 and you would take it, the same thing can happen here if it's on f5. I know, it's a little confusing. But let me show you this. 
in this position, while white can capture the f pawn by taking on f6, white cannot do the same thing to this pawn on d5 by making this move. Why do you ask? Here's why. En passant is only possible when the opponent makes his or her first pawn move by moving two squares forward. Okay, so check this out. Because this pawn was already here on d5, and now I play pawn to e5, next move, I cannot play en passant taking this. The only way this would happen is as follows. So let's pretend I play here. I'll make a random move like this. I advance my pawn forward. And now, if my opponent plays the pawn to d5, we've met our criteria for how en passant works. The pawns are directly adjacent and abreast to each other. It was the first pawn move of that d7 pawn, two squares forward. Only then can I en passant. Okay, so this is one of the most obscure rules of chess. Do not worry if it's a little confusing. It's supposed to be a little confusing. But if you go back and watch this video a couple times, do some of the exercises associated with this video, I'm sure you will get the hang of it. All right, just to recap one last time. En passant can only occur when the pawns are directly abreast to each other and the pawn has made its first move two squares forward. So if this pawn had gone one square forward first and then played pawn to d5, en passant would not be possible. Same exact thing here with this pawn. If this pawn had gone to f6 first and then to f5, en passant would not be possible. It is only possible on the opponent's first pawn move, okay? Just for pure visualization purposes, let's flip this around to make sure you really understand it, okay? So in this position, you pretend you're black. Let's say you go pawn to d5. Let's say white does not capture here on d5. Let's say they go knight to f3. Your pawn advances one square forward. So ask yourself, next move, can I take here and play en passant by taking on e3 and removing the pawn on e4? The answer is no. The only en passant possibility I have is if white decides on this pawn's first move to move it two squares forward to c4, then I can take the pawn this way. Okay, guys? So this video is the comprehensive one just to really make sure that you nail down everything about pawns and chess. They are often the trickiest piece along with a knight. So if you get those two down, you are good to go. Thank you for watching.